Association. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Great, great. <laughs> So we're gonna begin at seven o'clock. We just wanna shout out and have everyone go into the chat if they can and shout out their school district and their city and state where they're uh, streaming from. We wanna be able to see where all of our support for our librarians are across the nation. If you should happen to have a question, please make sure that you use our question and answer uh, box. And I'm so excited, so excited to see these wonderful librarians here. So make sure, don't forget to shout out your school library district or even public library. So during the webinar, please make sure you guys are on mute and send your questions and to the speakers and presenters using the Q&A. Welcome. I'm next. I'm next. Yes. Hello. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Am I next? Yes. Hello. <laughs> All right. Okay. So good evening, everyone. My name is Taryn Lemons. I am the chair of the School Librarians Ad Hoc or subcommittee within the Black Caucus of the Association, the so the American Library Association. I want to welcome all of you to our School Black Caucus School Librarians webinar. This webinar, webinar will highlight the work of successful librarians who have accomplished librarian, um, accomplished library programs that services diverse populations. Tonight, we will enjoy presentation from library leaders from around the country and we would like to acknowledge some of our distinguished guests and visitors. We have Kathy Carroll, our ASL president. We have Kelvin Watson, who is our past BC ALA president. We have our current president, Shanti Burns Simpson. And let's see if there's any other distinguished guests or visitor, uh, visitors who I have missed, please charge it to my head and not to uh, charge it to my heart, not to my head because I forgot. And we hope that you will enjoy all the presentations tonight. And as Danielle said, if you have any questions, please include them in the chat box and we will try to get to them. Back to you, Danielle. Danielle, you're on mute. I see. Well, good evening and welcome. We're waiting for people to log on. We have over 400 participants that's going to be logging on this evening. So far, we're just continually waiting and we're just gonna give everyone about a few minutes before we actually start our program. Again, make sure you go into the chat and you shout out your school district or your school or your city to show us where you're going to, where you're logging in from. Okay, so I need to do this again. Do I need to do the welcome again? <laughs> no, we're okay. taping. <laughs> you don't have to do the. <laughs> I don't mind because you know if everyone's not logged in, I I don't want anybody to feel less welcome. You know, I got <laughs> folks again. You know, welcome from San Diego. <laughs> So we're going to just give the speakers just a few minutes before we actually start. We don't want to rush anyone, but we also are seeing that the participants are logging on now. We're almost up to 70 people. We have over 400 people that have registered. So we're waiting for everyone to log in. And you know, I wanted to say something funny, but I guess I couldn't. <laughs> we were actually on time, not CP time. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's taping. I'm sorry. sorry. I just had to. <laughs> <laughs> so again, everyone, I see that we have a shout out. We have Minnesota in the house. Look at that. Shout out. I see Fayetteville, North Carolina's in the house now. And yes, Chicago, my hometown. That's where I am. Chicago's in the house. Chicago's in the house. Casey, you're still a Chicagoan. 
<laughs> Born, never will leave me. Well, it's great to see everyone. Again, remember the housekeeping tip. If you want to question, have a question for a presenter, please make sure you uh, state the presenter as well as ask the question in the Q&A. There's Decada Georgia's in the house. Hello, Kimberly Hunter. How you doing down there? And I see New York is in the house. All right, Thank Jennifer, she's from Still Illinois. Yes, everybody's coming on now. Thank you very much. AASL representation, all right now. Again, for those that are unfamiliar uh, with BCA, uh, ALA, uh, the Black Caucus American Library Association, later on we will have someone from membership to be able to discuss how to become a member of this wonderful organization. So we would like for you to be able to join us also for upcoming webinars. And Again, welcome, welcome from Minnesota. Kathy and Sule, oh, welcome, welcome. And we, I see we have someone from the Philippines here as well. Welcome. So we're gonna be getting started soon. I just want to also make mention at the very end, we will have our swag bag, which will also contain a certificate of participation. So we definitely want you to be able to look into that virtual swag bag where we have some wonderful, wonderful resources for you here. I see someone from Massachusetts. Oh, wow, welcome. All right. So James, if we can start. Again, I'm Danielle Baker. I'm the district librarian in Salk Village, Illinois. And I am here to welcome everyone to the BCALA School Librarian Committee webinar. How will my library look? Well, let's look at that. And we have wonderful guests. Again, I'm going to start off and we're gonna start all over again. And we're going to be starting with Karen. Karen is our chairperson for our committee and she's going to be welcoming us again. All right, Karen. Okay. All right, I'm gonna do much better the second time around. <laughs> Everyone, my name is Karen Lemons. I'm a library media specialist with Detroit School of Arts. Yes, DSA. I wanna welcome each and every one of you from all over the country and truthfully all over the world. Love this. We wanna welcome you to our BCLA School Librarian webinar. This webinar will highlight what some successful and accomplished librarians have done in terms of their um, in servicing the needs of their community and their school community as well as the community they serve. They represent accomplished library programs that they have um, used and have been successful. And tonight you will hear these uh, and enjoy these presentations from these library leaders from around the world. And at the same time, if you have any questions, as Danielle has mentioned, please put them in the chat box and we hope that we will have time to answer all the questions. And we have a wonderful swag bag for you as well. I also would like to take this time to acknowledge our distinguished guests. We have Ms. Shanti Burns, who is our current BCALA president. We also have Madam President, my, my, my friend, my good buddy, Kathy Carroll, who's our ASL president. And we have some past presidents with Kelvin Watson. So we want to say welcome and thank you for coming and supporting us. We appreciate that. And we hope that all of you will enjoy the presentations tonight. Sit back, relax, enjoy, and back to you, Danielle. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Karen. Again, everyone in the chat room, remember, shout out to your school district or your city where you are uh, streaming from. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. I now want to welcome 
this wonderful lady that I just met a year ago, and she walked up to me and said, I need to know who you are. <laughs> and guess what? She is a fabulous member of a sorority that I belong to, and I am so pleased to know this lady. Her name is Kathy Carroll, and she is the first African-American for the AASL. So I want to welcome Kathy Carroll. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this webinar. And I'm Kathy Carroll, president of the American Association of School Librarians. I'm often invited to participate in webinars and other meetings, but the Black Caucus will always hold a special place in my heart. And I would like to thank, personally thank Karen Lemons for her not so gentle nudge um, toward membership years ago. And I've been, ever since I attended my first meeting, I've been a member ever since. And I'd first of all, before I get into um, the AASL and the benefits of membership, I would first like to um, congratulate the Black Caucus on its phenomenal conference that was held in May of this year. It was so substantive and informative and I enjoyed every session I attended. So just a little quick background about myself. Um, I am the president of the American Association of School Librarians. I'm a proud Spectrum Scholar. I've worked extensively in the Spectrum community on its advisory committee and other, many other roles. ALA Council, A ALA Diversity Counselors Caucus and other organizations. But I'm also a librarian at Westwood High School in Columbia, South Carolina. So while I am involved on a national level, I am also a practi practitioner and I deal with students and teachers every day. So I have the unique perspective of national and practitioner. And so with that being said, I'd like to talk about AASL and the importance of membership because I'd like you also to have that unique perspective that I think enriches me as a professional. So if we could look at the slides, and while we're waiting for that, I'd just like to put a plug in for our national conference, the AASL National Conference, which is going to be held in October the 21st through the 23rd of 2021. And registration will open later this year, so please be on the lookout for that. And I know many of you we were discussing earlier hadn't been to Utah, that's an opportunity to view the beautiful state and also to participate in our conference. Next slide, please. It is now almost, the time is almost upon us for call for proposals. So please, we need your participation. We need your voice. We need your proposals. So please, August the 17th through December the 7th of this year, we're having a call for proposals for our national conference. I know that may seem a little early, but we need to make preparations so that we will have a spectacular and successful conference. So please put this on your radar. If you don't wanna do it by yourself, get with a friend, but we need you, we need your participation. We look forward to your proposal submission. Next, please. And share the wealth. This is in regards to a program we have that for each member, new member you recruit, if you're a member, your name will be entered into a drawing for a chance to win. And so therefore, that's another incentive to be a member because if you recruit another member, then you have a chance to win spectacular prizes such as um, registration for the National Conference, hotel, travel, all of that will be included. So please think about that. Next slide, please. All right, and so now we're gonna talk a little bit about why you should be a member. And I know some of you are thinking, okay, I don't know if AASL is the place for me, but then you know how you need to kind of flip that and think, if it's not the place for you, it's the National Association for School Librarians. Why is it not? Perhaps we need you. We need your voice, your vision, so you to get involved. So it will be a place for you and other um, similar thinkers like you. What some of the advantages um, to being a member our, we have advocacy tools or resources, which all of us know are really in great demand right now. You have access to all, which is the ASL Learning Library, a repository of ASL professional development, um, the Learning Library, opportunities for leadership and participation on a national level. And I just like to take a moment to thank Casey Boyd, Karen Lemons, Danielle Baker, because when I was making appointments for national committees, I said, would you serve without hesitation? They all said, yes. I said, do you have any area you're particularly interested in? And they said, wherever you need me. 
So therefore, not only are they all members, but they're all active members who are serving on national committees. We need them, we need you. So next slide, please. We're very involved with equity, diversity, and inclusion, and my presidential initiative is cultural sensitivity. I'd love your input. I'd love your work on this initiative. Next slide, please. And also one of the things that is free for everyone, you do not necessarily have to be a member, is that we're on top of this. We're dealing with the pandemic and resources that are going to help our profession, our association, not just our members, but our profession as a whole. Next slide, please. And so we have a plethora of resources that are just very practical. It's not some pie in the sky that we cannot obtain. It is something that boots on the ground that will apply to you, that will help you as you try to navigate this uncertain course. And regardless of how you're going back, if it's virtual, if it's a hybrid, if it's face-to-face, -face, that's all right. We have something for you. Next slide, please. And we had a town hall last night. Some of you I know personally were there, you participated. I think it was very informative, but also it's a gathering of like minds. That was last night. We're having another on September 16th. Registration is not just for members, but for anyone who would like to register, please have, keep an eye out for that. We're going to be advertising shortly. We would love to have you participate and hear your voice. And finally, next slide, please. Okay, so I think that's it. What I would like to just close by saying is that membership is important because it's kind of a quid pro quo. We have resources that are gonna benefit you, but we need you. So in the future of our association depends on remaining relevant. And that cannot happen without maintaining our core values while actively seeking diversity and new voice voices. So consider this a personal invitation from the president for you to join your National Library Association. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Madam President, Kathy Carroll from AASL. Coming up next, we have a speaker. Our speaker is the former president of the BCALA. He is the uh, library director for Broward County Library System. His name is Kelvin Watson. I wanna welcome you, Kev Kelvin. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so I'll start off by you know saying that um, I'm here to speak about partnering and how public libraries and uh, school libraries partner. So uh, you know before I get started, I'll tell you a little bit about a little more about my background. I, I shortened it some because I probably could take up the entire five minutes just talking if I went through my bio. But I wanted to also say that I am a Spectrum Scholar, and I also happen to be uh, a former AAS, AASL and RUSA scholar as well. So I actually was a member before of AASL and have uh, long had uh, my love for my uh, media specialist school librarians as well. So again, I'm Kelvin Watson, the director of the Broward County Libraries uh, Division here in, in uh, uh, South Florida. We serve about 1.9 million people and I oversee 38 locations across the county. Um, the Florida Library Association recently recognized Broward County Libraries as the 2020 Library of the Year, and I actually have uh, also was selected uh, as the 2019 uh, Florida Library Association Librarian of the Year. Um, so I started my career out as um, an officer in the Army. I transitioned to the private sector as an executive with Ingram Library Services, Borders Group, and the library corporations and companies that you may be familiar with that also work with schools and public libraries. These positions fuel my uh, passion for the field of library science. And so after library school, I joined the USDA National Agricultural Library. And then I went on to work at the Queens Library in New York for several years. As mentioned, uh, I am a past president of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. I've been a member since 19, um, since 1999, when I attended the fir my first conference in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, the national uh, conference, and uh, have been a member and working hard with, uh, with and for BCLA ever since. Um, I currently serve on the board of directors for the Book Industry Study Group. I'm also a member of the Public Library Association Board of Directors. I'm also on the board of directors of the Southeast Florida Library Network here 
and um, currently uh, AL ALA co-chair for the Digital Content Working Group. Um, and Casey mentioned to me when she reached out to me, we had a nice long conversation, but in her message, uh, she also says that I'm a BCLA Honorary School Library Committee member as well. So I'll just add that uh, uh, to, <laughs> to my bio. Um, so I've been here uh, in South Florida about three and a half years, um, working hard to lead some ambitious, ambitious and innovative initiatives so that Broward County Libraries can be positioned as a community leader and streamline access to resources all across the county. So I work very closely with our, with our schools um, and our media specialists, introducing new technologies, um, strengthening those partnerships and collaborative uh, collaborations. Um, I also work with other um, internal and external organizations. Um, so one of my focuses has been on inviting the uninvited, making people, everybody welcome to the public library, making sure that we are giving access to the 220,000 um, Broward County school uh, students that we work with. We also work with charter schools, uh, parochial schools, as well as early childhood centers. So we've, we've got many um, after school at your library programs. Um, this, um, uh, as of last week, um, for example, we uh, provided about 18,000 meals to youth 18 and under here in the community. Um, and that was through our walk up and uh, curbside service because we currently have our buildings closed to the public. But we're continually serving our, uh, our youth, um, our summer learning program, um, all virtual this year. And you know, when I, one of the things that we started out with to strengthen our partnership is every year for the past three years, we, three years, we sign up uh, our school students to get a digital library card. So we average about 80,000 students who sign up every year to get a digital, we call it a digital direct library card, which actually is a um, part of a community sharing of our resources. So we, um, along with the schools, each put in about $75,000 each towards additional resources for the, uh, the students to have access to um, all youth material, electronic, um, and they can actually access that through their Follett's uh, destiny system. But certainly during this, during this time of, um, of the COVID-19, we've, we've really had, um, so much uh, additional usage of those resources. We we continue, we had about 20% usage um, year over year. Since COVID started, we've been averaging about 70%. Um, we had a 70% increase in usage for those resources. So we are really dedicated to um, making sure that um, all of our library staff, our public library staff, our school libraries, uh, working together are rising to the challenge and making sure that we're providing the services um, without restrictions. Um, we're lending hotspots, we're lending tablets to the, the students as well. Um, we're live stream, streaming uh, book readings, um, just doing a, a, a lot of work, just making sure that um, we can deliver these uh, uh, effective services you know, during this time, as well as after COVID-19. Um, we um, are constantly um, on, in meetings um, with, our, with our school partners. And, and, you know, in doing that, we have, uh, again, really dedicated ourselves um, at, holistically as a community to work together to make sure that we are um, making sure that we're vital to um, maintaining uh, school life uh, you know, with some normalcy during this time for our, for our students, um, we are, uh, we're going to be going back to school, um, uh, all virtually for everybody, uh, on August 29th, uh, here in, uh, here in Broward. So we'll see how, we'll see how that goes, but we, um, certainly from a public library standpoint, we're here to serve. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit as I, you know, I'm going to run through a lot of things that we have been doing, some things that we um, have partnered with uh, the schools over the past 
um, three years so you can get an idea of some of the partnerships that, that you could also do with your public library and some of these that you, you may already be doing. So I mentioned the digital direct library card. Um, we do that again through our community share uh, program with uh, Baker and Taylor's Access 360. Um, we also um, meet with, uh, we have large meetings at least twice a year with all the media library specialists. Um, over the summer, we have our summer learning program. We leverage Green Stack to actually link the Broward County Schools and Broward County Library accounts. Um, we have numerous SAT and ACT prep. Uh, we do family reading nights throughout the year. Um, countdown to kindergarten. We are uh, participants in the Read for Record, where we actually go out and, and um, you know do reading myself as well. Um, we have a um, we do an annual Ashley Bryan Art Series that is at our African American uh, Research Library. Um, that that that's been going on for numerous years down here. We bring in um, youth authors and we do um, we bring in the media specialists from all over the county, uh, free of charge. Where we do a presentation all day. We do the feeding and uh, feeding everybody. Uh, and just really educational. We also have a, for, uh, also um, a Junior ROTC Cadet Day as part of our Veterans Festival annually. We do a Teen Empowerment Summit every December. Um, we also have our STEM ecosystem uh, trainings that we do, uh, Ready for College programs that um, our participate, participants do Bridge to Life meetings. And we also have our pop-up libraries uh, at some of our charter schools here as well. So I mentioned charter schools also, uh, along with the, uh, the Broward County Schools. So I, I know I ran through that list pretty quickly, but that just demonstrates, um, and that's just a few things, uh, uh, that we, from the Broward County um, public library standpoint, we do to work with and support our, um, our school partners here. Uh, it's really about um, allowing um, the the the, uh, the media specialists, the schools, to do their part. Public library, we have our role, and that and that is to support um, support the schools, and that's that's my philosophy. So I thank you, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, he's in Broward County. Um, I believe that's in, is that Florida? That's in, that? Florida. That's in South Florida. It is well, in South Florida. Florida. <laughs> it's in South Florida. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, both of them, actually um, one of them would say, to direct it to Kelvin. How did you create and execute the digital library cards? So the, the that, it's a two-fold project. So one, the, we had to, get um, get the students signed up, which is always a challenge. So we focused on the beginning of the year with all the other paperwork that goes home to parents. So that's the first step is to get the students to opt in. Um, the, other, the other part of that is we use the student ID numbers as, the, as their library card number. So we get a, we get a weekly um, we get a weekly data dump of the of all those that have signed up we then on the public library side create the library cards and then we send them all back it's it's all digital all electronic so that's how we uh that's how we do it and since we're using baker and taylor's uh who uh who is owned by follett and we have access 360 you can actually streamline that process so you can actually have two databases of of resources that actually can be um, can be accessed easily. Well, it's always great to work with the local li librarian, and we want to make sure that our school librarians are also working with their local librarian. We have another question, and it is again directed to uh, you, Kelvin, um, and it was basically of how would you get in contact um, or what things would a library media specialist get, uh, I think that, let me rephrase their uh, question. Um, how do they get in touch, I guess, with you on those digital library cards for their school? So what would the procedure be? 
Uh, for contacting me, it's, it, uh, let me, uh, uh, I'll type my, uh, my uh, email address in um, for, all, for everybody and just shoot me an email and we will uh, get you in contact with some, the right person on my team uh, who, who, who actually does that, that work. <laughs> well, we're just, just, I think what it is is in everyone in every different state and city, we wanna be able to have that rapport with our uh, local public library too. And so we wanna be able to have both work together. So those are, that was one of the questions that I think um, uh, a librarian is asking is how do they actually get in contact uh, oh. with their local librarian to be able to start this kind of process? And if they don't know, uh, maybe. I, I think, uh, I, I would say, uh, Danielle, it's, you know, the, the starting part is just to send the, the, the librarian here in, you know, here we have the county, but to send that local public library director an email of introduction, tell them what you, tell them what you want to do, how you, and you know, that you're interested in collaborating and, and it start and it starts there. Um, you know, we on, on our side, the public library, we did the reach out to the schools. Um, so we met, so I meet with the superintendent, I meet with the chief academic officer, um, several of his staff. So that's, that's how you do it. It's, it's really the reach out um, a, as well. I see some, yeah. No, no, go ahead. No, I, I think it's that, it's, it's, you know, and maybe I'm a different public library director, but I actually respond and follow up with, uh, with folks that, uh, that email me um, and, and ask me questions. And, you know, again, supporting our schools is one of my, um, one of my key initiatives, um, recognizing that the, that the community as a whole needs to be served. And, I have, from the public library standpoint, I have um, a significant amount of, of, of budget to, to, uh, to assist. Uh, again, I'm not trying to beat up the school library, but I have money to support their initiatives and make sure that we have, uh, you know, people who don't, um, who don't have resources, the library, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm here to do. Okay, well, thank you. And we have one last question um, uh, toward how do, how are the student how the student privacy issues re, uh, resolved? How are they resolved? Student privacy issues. So the privacy, yeah, the privacy issues are resolved is because we don't use their. Um, when we get that data from the schools, we're essentially only getting the the school ID number and not the students' information, not their you know not their uh, their PII, not their you know, the name, address, or, or any other identifying um, information, right, that, that is pertinent to the school, just to the student. So leveraging a student ID number leaves it anonymous. And so that's the only thing that we get, and then we send that back to the school, and they, they match, they do the matchup to make sure that the, uh, that the student has access. Okay. And we have another question. Uh, from Richard, and he asked, "Should the uh, public library use a Lexile system?" What's the question? Should the public library use the Lexile system? I, I, what I would say is yes, but I am probably one of the few like public libraries uh, that is that even understands what the Lexile reading level is. So I would say yes. But um, I'm not sure what my other uh, what my other colleagues would say. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Kathy Carroll, Welcome. as well as Kelvin, <laughs> for coming on. Thank you very much. Next, next we have two speakers. One is a library media specialist in New York City. She's with the Department of Education. Her name is uh, Janelle Robinson. And then we also have the Library Operations and Instructional Coordinator in New York City Department of Education, Donna Gray. They're going to be speaking to us regarding our libraries and how they should be looking this year. So welcome Janelle and welcome Donna. Good evening, everyone. Um, 
As um, Danielle introduced me, my name is Janelle Robinson and I am a campus librarian here in the Bronx. I work collaboratively with another librarian, Christina Gavin. And Donna isn't here tonight, but she co-authored this section with me and she is here um, in spirit. So, next slide, please. Next slide. So during the first days of remote learning here in New York City, our director, Melissa Jacobs, um, knew that librarians needed um, a form of guidance to not only help ourselves, but to help our administrators as well and pretty much be able to transfer in-person instruction to an online platform. So with that, um, we were able to, through this document, exemplify how the work of the school librarian would be transferred wholly into a digital space. So the guidance was created um, using the roles and responsibilities of the school librarian um, as detailed in the New York State Education's um, Department's School Library Media's Program Evaluation Rubric. Um, since then, um, we've been highlighted um, both statewide and, in, and nationally. Next um, slide, please. I'm going to read this quote in, um, uh, for Donna, who is not here tonight. Librarians are not only poised to take on this challenge, we are also prepared and innovative enough to make the remote learning, virtual environments, and digital programming successful and engaging. And this quote is from Melissa Jacobs, the director of the New York City School Library Services. And it's uh, from uh, in an article, uh, School Librarians Leading Through Crisis, Bookless, June of 2020. So with this quote, our director um, reminds us that remote learning has provided um, us librarians with distinct moments in which we are able to shine and provide our talents um, through turbulent times. Next slide, please. So the document is divided into three main sections, which are teaching, information access, and administration. Next slide, please. So many school librarians find they spend a chunk of their time um, delivering and developing lessons and assignments for the classroom, which in our case as librarians, the library is our classroom. And so these assignments and lessons are rich and engaging and meaningful. And in order to translate that into a remote setting, we were, we had to now look at things differently, but be able to still have the same outcomes and effects. So um, all school libraries should have an online platform um, that highlights student work, just as we would in our physical um, setting and thinking about collaborating and assisting students. This can be done using virtual office hours, Google form or emails. Next slide please. Another big aspect of our job is to grant access to our school communities. And again, um, this can be accessed by, this can be accomplished by managing Google forms um, that we're able to sift through the request from teachers and students. Um, we can also make sure that we provide current and relevant online resources such as databases and also the electronic resource that is needed from our students that as we've discovered, many are affected by um, a lot of circumstances in which there was presenting a digital divide amongst our um, students. And just overall promoting the school library. I don't know about you all, but sometimes in the library gets lost in the shuffle. And so this was an opportunity for us to not only reaffirm ourselves in the physical space, but also let it be known how valuable we are in a hybrid or a 100% online setting. Next slide, please. And lastly, we're also program administration administrators, and that's not only in-house, but also online. So remotely, we can continue to train our um, staff and volunteers using Google and Microsoft Teams. 
We are able to develop, you know, programming through me social media, newsletters, and our website, and also um, coordinate professional developments for our entire school community, including our colleagues and um, our students. Next slide, please. So funny enough, I started this, my current position the week that we started remote learning. So this translation of practice was not only helpful for me transitioning into remote teaching, but also just being a new librarian in this new setting. So me and Christina, my co-librarian, we were able to co-teach um, through Google Classroom and Zoom. Um, we were able to update our website and make sure that it was chocked full of available resources and apps. I've, I've learned so many apps within like the last few months, which have been so invaluable that I use personally myself. Uh, we responded to over 400 Google Form submissions and emails. We got emails around the clock and we answered around the clock. <laughs> Um, we were able to revitalize our social media presence to connect with our students and our um, educational community at large. We created how-tos with presentations and videos, and we also recorded an audiobook to grant access to our reluctant readers as we were a recipients of a grant, the Lambda um, Literary Grant, which was initially supposed to bring an author in in person However, because of the um, virus, we had to transform um, the opportunity online. And honestly, it was just as great in my opinion. The students were just as engaged. We were able to ask questions in real time. The author, Julian Winters, who is the author of How to Be Remy Cameron, was so engaging and so inviting. Um, and he sent us signed bookmarks because of course he wasn't able to sign the books in person. And um, we've gotten feedback from the students and they definitely enjoyed the opportunity. And also online, we're still able to provide PD for our teachers. So we taught live sessions on um, different resources such as New ZLA and Libby and so on and so forth. And also we were able to still meet with our departments and um, our administration online. Next slide, please. We might have to adjust our platform and lens, but we know how to support students remotely. Be confident in your skills and remember that you are an asset. As time passes, our lives will slowly return to normal and we will once again walk through the doors of our libraries. It will take some time, but we will get back to normal. This is another quote from Melissa Jacobs, director of the New York City School Library Services. She was quoted in the Bookless um, article. So in wrapping up this section of the presentation, I leave you all with this question. Do you feel confident in applying the translation of practice this upcoming school year, whether it be hybrid or 100% um, remotely? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And I hope everybody was able to answer that poll in the question, do you feel confident in applying the transla translation of practice this upcoming school year? And for those that did not put in their poll, if you could just go down to the bottom. We also are asking again for questions and answers. Are there any questions? Ah, we're looking at it. So far, we have a great 70% said there, yes, they are still confident. And we still have 30% that still needs, you know, just a little bit assistance. And this is where we come for our resources, BCALA, our, our school librarians, please reach out to someone and we will be able to definitely help you. So Sally has a question. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Sally just made a comment. 
But Nancy has a question. How do you feel a black librarian with the task of providing the information to educate the rest of the building about the movement? And when we talk about the movement, Nancy, it wasn't specified, so I don't want to assume a specific movement. But I guess, Janelle, Civil Rights, Black Lives Matter. Thank you very much, Nancy. Okay. Um, it, was a, it was a mixed um, blessing. Um, one, because I am a Black um, woman um, and I'm empathetic to everything that's happening right now. It was a lot of my mental health just on a personal um, level. But honestly, when I was approached to you know, help navigate and assist you know, students and colleagues, I honestly felt honored. And to be frank, I wasn't as trusting of other people doing it. So I figured, you know, might as well be me if, you know, if this needs to happen. So it, it was a big task and, but, you know, a task that was necessary. And, you know, it's, and I'm still dealing with it, you know, as I'm sure we all are. But, um, and I think that's a great question because we're all, while we are all librarians, I mean, and, and most of us are African American that are on this call, but all of us, we cannot be biased because all of our patrons have some kind of movement. So we have been very supportive of practically all of the movements. And that's what we also want to be able to stress to our patrons. We have to be able to be open, but also be honest for everything and that's providing information and true information so were there any other questions oh i see did you create your is that top from scratch uh yeah your uh, uh did you create the um, um transition from scratch was it based on somebody else's resource how did you suggest it that we begin. And so this person is trying to figure out where do they actually start? So the translation of practice was actually um, inspired by the New York State's um, Educational Department's School Library Media Program in which they described in-house, um, in-person roles and responsibilities of the school librarians. So Melissa Jacobs and her team encompassing of Donna Gray were able to pretty much read it and be inspired and envision how it would look um, in an online setting. So that and also just having constant feedback from the central office and other librarians, you know, from BCLA and from our New York City, we, um, I'm a part of a listserv and hearing people come up with ideas and pose questions that I didn't even thought, that I didn't think I knew, thought of, but to hear it, I'm like, oh yes, they articulated exactly, you know, something that I was wondering and being able to get almost instantaneous um, responses through the listserv has been so helpful in being able to springboard off of um, those suggestions and those comments have been super helpful. So we pretty much started with that, but it evolved as necessary, you know, because there were always new hurdles, literally daily. And, I, and there's something that New York City, you guys were wonderful in creating that, uh, 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 that piece for the librarians, the school libraries, when we went remote. And that was in, that's going to be placed in our virtual swag bag for librarians to be able to see if you are remote, if you're gonna be hybrid, or if you, even if you are going to be uh, in school, the New York City, and I believe uh, that with you guys created that um, piece. Uh, can you tell just a little bit about that piece? Uh, and it's the PDF file, is going to be located in the listserv for it, and it is going to be the uh, uh, transition of services of what your library may look like now. So that's a great piece from New York. Uh, thank you. Well, it looks like we have no other questions. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Janelle. Thank you. Again, if you have any questions, please make sure you place it in the question and answers. And if you want to in the chat and you're just logging on, make sure you still send out a shout out to where you are streaming from. Next, we have
we have a boatload of information and we have Stacy Nunn. She's the library media specialist out of Baltimore City Public Schools. And to accompany her is Sharon Wiggins. Sharon is also a library media specialist. And she's out of, I believe it's New York, is that correct? All right, well, welcome. I, I, and I am so sorry I didn't prepare for that name. Is it, how do you pronounce that? Chappaqua. Chappaqua Central School District, and that is in New York, is that correct? Yes. All right, well, thank you and welcome. And you guys can also talk uh, a, a bit about that piece uh, that's going to be in the virtual swag bag. So I'm going to take it off. And if anybody have any questions, please place it in the question and answers. Well, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to get started here and pick up on our last presenter um, and the question about civil rights, Black Lives Movement, um, Black Lives Matter Movement. And um, so for me, they're inextricably tied because, you know, being home was very much um, focused around what was happening in the country. Next slide, please. So I've been thinking about this as far as, and, and I did get some recommendations, or I should say some questions about recommendations for professional development reading um, and how we could do a better job as a community. Um, I was overwhelmed initially. I didn't want to just throw a lot of resources at people, especially people who did not have a background um, in understanding the history of Black Americans. Um, so for me, it was also about making it um, digestible for myself um, and not putting myself on the line and exhaustion um, while also providing resources that could kind of help get things started. So I started thinking about kind of book, um, book bundles. Um, Goldie Muhammad, she's done a lot of talking about cultivating genius and her equity framework. If you haven't come across that, I very much encourage you to seek her out and seek out her work. Um, it's a book published by Scholastic. It is back ordered, but it's often available. Um, and then there's Stand, which is the YA version by Jason Reynolds. And then the senior version is, of course, Stand from the Beginning by Abram X. Kendi. So I thought it would be interesting to look at what do these um, books say to each other? What's the conversation between those? Next slide. Next, thank you. And along those lines, um, Eddie Glau Jr. has just released his book, Begin Again, looking at James Baldwin's America. And he calls it James Baldwin's Crucible. And he's really kind of looking at how could James Baldwin speak to these times. And I know James Baldwin has been invoked quite a bit during these times. So combining that with Heavy, um, I'm gonna pronounce his name wrong, forgive me, but Kiesi, I think it is, Layman. Forgive me for that. Um, Heavy is a memoir about his experiences in Mississippi and Tadahisi Coat, Between the World and Me, which has been out several years, but also a memoir or letters to his son. Um, I think those would be an interesting dialogue to have. What What is coming up in all of these? Next slide. Similarly, um, Barracoon, I actually found out about at, um, it was being released while I was at an ALA conference. So I got an advanced copy. Um, Zora Neale Hurston is, in my opinion, required reading, um, but her um, documenting uh, the story of the last black cargo is really important, along with Warmth of Other, Other Sons, Understanding America's Great Migration. So, and as well as Cast, which is the new release from Isabel Wilkerson. Next slide, please. And finally, um, so you want to talk about race. I think she has a great conversational tone. I think it's a great book that can reach um, people from any setting, um, looking at these conversations, which we're all having now, um, as well as why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? This has come up a lot. Um, my district is majority white, and whether it's Asian students or black students or um, Indian students, you do see, you know, these issues are still coming up and we're still faced with, you know, why are schools so segregated? Next slide. So these, um, 
this is some statistics. It goes back to 2017. Um, there are statistics for 2018, which have been released recently, um, but both of these are looking at how uh, we're, how people of color are represented in our book publishing industry. And I think that's hugely important as far as understanding how we might look at bringing in more print resources um, so that all of our students have those mirrors, windows, and sliding doors, right? So, and, and even in 2018, yes, some of, some of the statistics went up slightly, but only ever so slightly. For example, in 2018, there were 200 rather than 132 books by African-American um, authors and books about African-Americans went up from 355 to 405. So you're talking about marginal increases. It's still not representative of the population of this country. Next slide. So along those lines, here are some resources. Some of them you may know, some of them are maybe new to you. Um, and again, all of these will be in the swag bag with the brown bookshelf. Um, has great blogs, features, uh, writers by people of color, which is great. Um, own Voices, Kid Lit, looking at books that are written by people from a specific um, identity um, and, and looking at how we can bring that into the classroom. We need diverse books, of course. And then the Anti-Race School Librarians Now is a colleague, Megan Rose, who um, put together a Padlet with some great resources for young people. Um, Anti-Racist School Librarians Now is also, I believe, a Facebook group. So that may be something you wish to look into. Next slide, please. So along those lines, we have a lot of YA books. Um, Clap When You Land, anything by Elizabeth Acevedo is wonderful. Um, Indigenous People's History of the United States. Uh, this is My America, Genesis Begins Again, which has won so many awards. Um, you'll have a copy of these slides, Monday's Not Coming, which is heartbreaking, um, but an important story to tell. Not so pure and simple, Lamar Giles, he's been doing some great work as well. Next slide, please. Renee Watson's there. And of course, um, All American Boys, um, Casey actually did a webinar yesterday with Saddleback Publishing. If you haven't seen it, you may want to go look for that. Um, they read All American Boys um, in her district for all the seventh and eighth graders. Look both ways, Tristan Strong. March is, in my opinion, essential reading, um, along with understanding other cultures. It's not, you know, it, it's not, we're not looking at focusing on only, as someone else said, like we have to look at this as kind of a, a larger systemic issue. Next slide, please. And then of course there are children's books um, that Skin Again by Bell Hooks and Something Happened in Our Town. Next slide, please. So in looking at this, part of the issue is, yeah, that's great to have these lists of books, right? But how are we accessing them? And so I really wanted to make sure um, that everyone knows about various public library resources. As a school librarian, it's been essential for us to work with the public library. Uh, Hoopla is a great service offered. Sora is the little guy in the middle with OverDrive and Libby. So Sora is the app for students um, it's through OverDrive and Libby is this app for um, adult readers. What's nice about Sora is it's going to filter through all of those um, books to make sure that the content that's appropriate for that for the younger students is is available there. Um, you may wish to check they were OverDrive was offering free platforms for students for a while during the pandemic. Um, and my colleague Melissa and I were able to work with the public library. So that speaking to um, what Mr. Watson was saying earlier, we actually were able to set it up so kids could log in with their Google account to our Sora app. And then it was also authenticated for public library. So some kids had public library cards, some didn't. Um, and by doing it this way through the school where they all had an account and we were teaching all of them how to access it, they were able to um, get access to also public library books. 
if you're in a BOCES area, BOCES, we first went through BOCES because we had a consortium and so we worked it out with them so that we could um, be part of a consortium of books and then we also had our own accounts and worked with the public library as well. Um, RB Digital is kind of the rebranding of recorded books, which has also been great. I'm also a certified special ed teacher. So that was always a wonderful resource for um, accessibility. Uh, International Children's Digital Library, again, free books that kids can read online and you can choose different languages. So I have a friend whose daughter is in a bilingual uh, Mandarin English program. And so that's a great resource that she can use so that during the pandemic, she's also, you know, reading in Chinese as well as in English. Next slide, please. And lastly, um, these are just some more services. Audible does have um, free audiobooks for kids to listen to. You can see, you can discover them up there, like Crown is for free, the crossover is for free. So some of these subscription sites also offer free content you may want to look into. Teaching books, um, Nick Glass has made all of that available and free. BookBub, you can sign up for. They'll tell you when there are Amazon books that are free. And the same is true of Free Booksy. Um, you can log into that site or just visit that site and you'll see that uh, what book is free for that day from Amazon if you wanted to kind of preload a Kindle and such, as well as Epic, which they are making free and available from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday until June of next year. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stacy. Thanks so much. Good evening. My name is Stacy Nunn. I just wanted to make one simple correction um, because the Baltimore area covers um, such a wide range. Um, I work for Baltimore County Public Schools, not Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, I am going to talk now that we have some idea of different resources that you can use um, to um, direct your own professional development and or if you are planning a PLC within your school community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some platforms that you can use to um, disseminate the information. Um, number one, if you um, if you refer back to this afterwards, um, each link um, underlined here um, will provide you with a source of information. Um, under eBooks 101, I have simply um, created a wakelet on what an eBook is, as well as a mini tutorial on wakelet. Um, um, additional resources of ebooks is Storyline Online. Um, I, pres um, I use that frequently within my library, both as a whole group as well as um, having kids do this in a station rotation. There are a ton of different books that they can um, access, and it's suitable for grades kindergarten through fifth grade. I also um, have become familiar with Bibliomasium. Um, it's also a good resource. It allows you to curate um, different online resources, as well as the Digital Public Library of America. Um, one piece of advice that I have before you even um, use these different platforms, which some are also listed on the AASL um, best web apps and website list, um, make sure that your school um, technology department will support um, you pushing these programs out. I know in my county, we have a select um, group of Web 2.0 tools um, that are permitted to be used within the district. Um, I know that teachers and um, librarians use other platforms. Um, however, those platforms aren't necessarily supported by our technology department. So it's really important to make sure and get um, a clear understanding of what is going to be supported by your technology department versus not. Um, and also, we have listed some ideas for virtual community building here as well. And that is a link with some information. Next slide, please.
So here we have some different resources for if you um, want to curate and present. Um, I know my district uses Schoology, which is a huge platform. Um, it has several different features. Um, just a few of what I love are the voice recording, or you can um, video and voice record student messages right there. And that's huge as a librarian, right? You don't have a lot of time with students, but if you need to send them a message about the curriculum or you need to respond to a parent, that is a perfect way to respond to a parent. Um, Padlet is also great. I've, um, if you click on the link when you have access to this, in the Padlet, uh, not only have I um, 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 used a quick tutorial, which is by somebody else who I've given credit to, but um, I've also um, shared an example of a Padlet that I created um, and it's for student use. And I also included a voice recording in that as well. Um, VoiceThread is another nice um, way to um, present. Um, I like VoiceThread if you are presenting to teachers. Um, I think that's much uh, a better tool to present to teachers. Buncee is nice. Of, of course, um, there's Google Classroom as well. Um, next slide, please. So, um, with that being said, we've um, every presenter has referred you to our swag bag. Um, in our swag bag, um, there are lots of links and lots of information um, about the different platforms um, that are available to you. Um, I would just advise you to just pick if you're new um, as a librarian, I would advise you to scroll through and just pick a few applications. Um, it can be extremely overwhelming trying to use so many different tools at one time. Um, I suggest you get in there, use the tools, master those, and then think about how you can use some others. Um, the, that AS, AASL Best Apps and Website list is updated annually. Um, keep in mind, we are in a time of virtual learning, so some things will be um, free, other things will have a cost to them, other things will just have limits on how free, um, how long they are free. Um, some of the things you will find in the swag bag are um, things about information about Code Academy, um, teaching books, PBS learning, um, as well as the News Literacy Project. Next slide, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. So we're going to take a poll and I thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Sharon, for giving us all those different resources. And remember that our virtual swag bag is going to be at the very end. Yes, you are able to share that with your colleagues, with you know, your teachers. It's a great tool. It's a great resource. It gives you a lot of different information. And remember, it can be overwhelming. And just because things are free does not necessarily mean it might be the best for your school. So remember, always try it out before suggesting it to your peers, to your colleagues. Look at it first. And then a great thing about right now is that a lot of them are trials and they are free so that you don't have to. Be, you can test it out first. So remember, you don't want a lot of it. You want to be able to get to it. Now, here's what we, our second poll question. Are you spending time on professional development in order to support students and staff virtually on anti-racist practices throughout the year? Can you guys be able to adequately answer that for us? And we'll give you a few minutes. Again, if you have any questions about our swag bag, virtual swag bag, you can post it and our virtual swag bag will be given to us at the very end. Also, I have been posting some a Google form. If you all would be able to make sure that you fill out the Google form, it will allow us to be able to see exactly 
what we can improve. This is extremely exciting. This is our first time go around and we definitely want you to be able to come and support us as well as join the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. So, and I'm waiting for those polls. We're gonna give you maybe 20 more seconds. And do we have the results from that poll number two? Oh, wow. And I hope you guys are able to see that. It says, yes, some, about one to five hours, about 26% of us, um, moderately, five to 15 hours, that's about 40% of us. 19% said yes, a lot, more than 15 hours. And then we do have some that are still uncomfortable with it and they're at 15 percent either they may agree or may not agree might be uncomfortable don't know exactly what the none would be so thank you very much for being honest thank you for that poll next up next up we have branding and we have a young lady, her name is Casey Boyd. She's the Library Media Specialist at the District of Columbia and Public Schools. I have known Casey, we went through a master's degree program almost 20 years ago now in Chicago at Chicago State. And then we also have Dr. Pamela Moore. She is a professor um, and she's out of Alabama. Uh, they're going to provide us information on marketing and branding. So I would like for you guys to be able to give us some information. And anyone that have any questions, please make sure you place it in the Q&A. Thanks. And good evening. So before I get started, I do want to uh, give a title of a book, and I'll show the, the cover a little later. Um, Katie asked a question. You know, uh, what book would you recommend for school teachers to use to talk about race? And though there are so many that are very popular right now that are um, hot on the market and they're, and they're selling out, I like to go back to Glenn E. Singleton's book, which is Courageous Conversations About Race, a field guide for, for achieving equity in schools. This is the Bible, in my opinion. Um, he's written a very definitive guide for educators to combat race and, and, and ex re-examining uh, some of the issues that we have in the K-12 uh, public school uh, arena. So that's a really good read, and it's a read that actually my school uh, engaged in last year. But continuing on, I want to talk about a little bit of advocacy and your school library program. Uh, next slide. Please understand something. There is a little lag, and across the country we have rain and everything, so um, you will see a little lag in our slide um, advancements. Advocacy. You know, a lot of librarians that I talk to, they, they actually say to me, I can't do that. This is too difficult. Um, I'm not that kind of person to be so showy. Well, believe it or not, uh, to, if you really, if you know me for a long time, I am not the, the most um, vocal, outspoken, outspoken person that you think I am. Uh, I'm extremely introverted. And what happened to me was that working in libraries for 22 years has indelibly changed my personality. And it changed my personality where I became more vocal because I got angry about the inequities that I was seeing in, in K-12 education, in particular with the school library program. Next slide. So I had to step out of, outside of my box. And I started to think, you know, am I going to be complicit and sit back and not say anything or am I going to get up and, and actually speak? And I had to find my voice. And that was difficult for me to do because, you know, I'm a very skittish person, timid sometimes, believe it or not, to get to know me, you realize I'm extremely timid about some things. And it's not my personality to be that, that bold and in your face, but, uh, you know, like I said, libraries has helped me find my voice, my inner child, my, my inner Brooklyn, 
uh, my inner, what, what's some of these, these, these bold women names that are out here that really just uh, encompasses speaking out, hear me roar kind of thing. So, so I had to find my voice and eventually I did. Next slide. And in finding my voice, that's when I had to turn to some inspiration. My late father, you know, he was a big inspiration to me because he encouraged me to go into K-12 education and become a, a middle school librarian. That was one level of inspiration. But I think in terms of doing this work that we do, we have to find different levels of inspiration. And I'm going to show you just two or three of them for me that really, that really does it for me. Next slide. Um, the first is Dr. King. I am uh, the child of two civil rights activists from Louisiana, and um, I was taught the ways of King and the peace, peaceful uh, manner of a peaceful protest and his uh, theology, which is um, one of my favorite quotes is, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. And that that that's that leads to me to that question are you going to be complicit and just not say anything or are you going to speak up and speak out next slide so actually yesterday on the aasl uh town hall with madam president um miss kathy carroll uh someone on that uh that town hall actually said this quote and this is one of my favorite ones from uh, Sister Shirley Chisholm. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Let me tell you something. I have been walking out my building and sometimes my coworkers are having meetings about literacy and libraries and everything behind my back. And guess what I do? I pull up the chair, I pull up the stool, I stand in the corner, but I'm in the room and you gonna hear me because you shouldn't have left me out of that conversation. We have to buffalo our way into these conversations because people are making decisions about us in central office and also in our schools, okay? That's right, powerful women, unbought, unbought and unbossed. That's right, Sister Michelle. Next slide. So, continuing on, we use various platforms to advocate our work. Now, if you follow me on any of my social media accounts, you know that we are having a problem in Washington, D.C. And with that problem, we had to amplify our voices. So we started using social media heavily. And in one uh, instance yesterday, we did a webinar for uh, Saddleback uh, Education. This is the first time that they had librarians featured on their, on their site in this manner. And, and also uh, through a webinar series, and we took advantage of that opportunity because what we did in, in, in that, um, on that uh, webinar is that we showed what we were doing in the virtual world and we were counteracting that narrative of because they're not in the brick and mortar, they're not needed. We are needed more than ever before. Don't let anybody do that Jedi mind trick on you. Next slide. So continuing on. Librarians create, create hashtags. Hashtags are extremely important because this is how you get your messaging across. I put in this uh, chat already, BCALA, School Librarians. It's a way of marketing and branding what you do. Here are some popular hashtags out here, not just for DC, but they're, they're used universally by librarians across the country and some specifically librarians like in New York City School Librarians, the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Library Association. They also use the Safe School Librarian hashtag as well. Next slide. And continuing on, we have to engage our local and our national have allies in this argument and in this fight. You have got to go in the community and beyond going to ALA, Black Caucus, every library, I had to go to Ward 6 parent-teacher organization, digital, digital and e equity uh, in DC education, DECAL, you know, Washington Teachers Union, you have to find these allies. You have to sometimes re-educate them about what we do. And you have to get them on your side so you can have a stronger voice and fight. Next slide. Every library is a petition, is hosting a petition for us. We have an active petition supporting not only DC librarians, but also librarians across the country that are experiencing threats. This is another level of advocacy. Next slide. Now, you probably wonder, why do I have Cardi P, Cardi B, 
in a librarian presentation. Let me break this down. This is not easy work. It's very difficult. And when Cardi B said this in one of her songs, knock me down nine times, but I get up 10. That's what the school librarian has to do in today's K-12 school, because we have people who are changing the narrative. They're telling us what we are. They tell us, they're telling us what we should be doing. We have people that, you know, they can be a walk-in librarian. They think this work is easy. It is not, and we know it. So you might knock me down, but guess what? Casey's getting right back up, and you should too. Next slide. So pushing through adversity and closing, be mentally prepared, take stock of what you've experienced already, stay calm. Adversity provides valuable insight. Take that time to just reflect on what's happened and try and keep your emotions out of it as much as possible. Embrace that adversity as a chance for opportunity. Refuse to give up and keep a positive mindset. Next slide. So I'm gonna leave you with this quote. I love listening to Brother Matt, Joe Madison on Sirius XM every morning, <laughs> Monday through Friday. And he asked the question, what are you going to do about it? You're going to sit there and be complicit and you're going to get up and start speaking. And on that note, because we're closing in on our 90 minute mark, I'm going to pass it on to the phenomenal, the wonderful, the sister girl. Come on, Dr. Pamela Moore. Come on, bring <laughs> us home. Bring us home. <laughs> Thank you, Casey, and thank you all the others who've spoken uh, before me. This is such a phenomenal group to be a part of, and I can't stress enough that you need to delve into the resources, connect with each other. The short time that I have to talk, I really want to leave two thoughts with you. Casey has already talked about being an advocate, and being an advocate, it is so very important. Advocate is described as a person who supports a proposal or supports uh, a, an action. I think though, next slide please, we need to work on being librarian activists because an advocate only takes you so far. An activist is a person who is willing to step up to the plate, who is willing to step out when you are unsure about how will they take what you're saying? How will they listen to you? Your role as a school librarian means that you are that activist. As a library educator, often I think about the fact that many librarians only person that does do what they do at their school. Everybody, as Casey has stated, feels that they're an expert on this. However, you know that you are that trained individual. You have the background, and as I told a former student on yesterday, you are equipped for this. I'll also say you are equipped as an activist. If you don't speak out now, when will you speak out? And you can't wait. Advocacy is good, and I will always be an advocate for school libraries. But we must ro move into the role of activists so we can be there so that this will not go away. We know we are needed. We know our value, and others must know as well. Thank you. That's my part. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you, KC. That was wonderful. And remember, you are the advocate. You're, remember, you're advocating for students, for literacy. So now we have the poll question number three. If we can have that up and everybody answer this poll question, please. Now that you heard all three presentations that target school library challenges, well, which issue do you feel most strongly about? We have five of them there. If you guys would be able to take that poll, we'll give you a few seconds and then we'll show you those results. Hopefully everyone has been equipped with this information with tons of resources. All right. So we're going to be closing the poll in about two seconds. And if we will be able to see the results. All right. So it looks like 43% said equitable access to information. 19% uh, of us said reading encouragement and promotion. 11% said literacy instruction and selection of material. And it's really interesting that 0% said digital citizenship. That's very interesting. 
since we're in that digital age. And then we also have the 26% school library funding and staffing of certified librarians, which is extremely important. Well, thank you guys, thank you guys. Well, next up, we have Mr. Ruloff Clay. He is our membership chairperson for the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. So we would like to bring him and welcome him to our first webinar. And he's going to give us just a little information on how to become a member. Thank you, Danielle. And good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are, everyone. I'm Rudolph Clay. Um, and as Danielle mentioned, I am the co-chair for the BCLA Membership Committee. If you're already a member of BCALA, I want to thank you. And if you're not a member, I want to invite you and encourage you uh, to join. The mission of BCALA is to serve as an advocate for the development, promotion, and improvement of library services and resources to our nation's African American community. And the second part is also important and to provide leadership for the recruitment and professional development of African American librarians. So we're about providing services to African Americans and providing resources and recruiting African American librarians. Uh, our, one of our largest goals is doing exactly what Casey has organized this evening um, and all of our speakers, which is providing professional development. Now, there are a number of categories as far as membership is concerned that you can actually see on the screen. I'll just mention briefly three of them. One is the regular membership, which is $45 a year, but there's also a library support staff uh, membership, which is only $20 a year. And if you're a student, there is a student category of $10. Not only for you, you know, one of the, our goals obviously is to increase membership in BCALA. We would like to increase it to over a thousand members. We are at about 700 members. Uh, but memberships are also, once you join, the great gifts, and especially at the support staff lab level or at that student level, uh, that's a great way to bring in new librarians uh, into uh, BCLA and bring students into BCLA. Now, one thing uh, I'll just mention briefly is that BCLA is one of the five ethnic caucuses of the American Library Association, ALA but you don't need to be a member of ALA to join BCALA. The memberships are separate. But the benefits of joining BCALA is just like what you're experiencing this evening, connecting with colleagues, building networks, opportunities to work on committees and address issues that we're facing in our communities that we've uh, been talking about this evening, and the opportunity to participate in regional and national conferences, not only as attendees, but as presenters. So for those of you that are not yet members, we hope that you will uh, think about joining to help BCLA support its strategic directions, which include all the things we've mentioned this evening, inclusion, social justice, and supporting our librarians, our libraries, and our communities. So again, I'm Rudolph Clay, I'm co-chair of the BCLA Membership Committee. My uh, other co-chair is Faye Mohammed, and we both encourage you to consider joining BCALA. Uh, my email is listed there, but you can just go to our website, bcala.org, and click on membership. And most of the things that I've just talked about here, there's much more information about uh, joining. And also, you certainly can, uh, you can email me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rudolph. Now, next, we're going to have our BCALA president, Shante Burns Simpson. She's going to give us uh, information also about BCALA. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, what other BCALA webinar would you hear a, a Cardi B quote <laughs> or about the Black Eagle, Joe Madison? So. <laughs> High five to Casey Boyd. This is what I'm talking about when we talk about BCALA professional development. You just don't know what you're going to get, but you're going to get good stuff. So I am Shantae Burns Simpson, the current president of this amazing uh, organization, Black Caucus of the American Library Association. I'm also the manager of school support and outreach for the New York Public Library. 
We support 1,800 public schools and about 1.2 million students, along with private charter and homeschoolers. Uh, yeah, you could go back to the, the first slide. Thank you. So again, like Kelvin, coming from the public library perspective, I will say that the school librarians are our point of contact for schools. We want to support the formal learning that's happening during the day uh, with our informal learning after school. So like um, Kelvin highlighted, things like the electronic barcode, uh, we are doing using our Simply E app. So the app, uh, because of COVID, was already preloaded to tablets for families. Uh, you can go back to the other slide. Um, to uh, already preloaded on the tablets that was given out to 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 uh, students uh, for COVID, and then the parents are able to sign up for the e card, and that information is sent directly to the family. So. We also like to provide diverse um, authors to schools because we all know authors can be pricey. So we have a program called My Authors NYC where we were able to get uh, Jason Reynolds, E.B. Zaboy, Elizabeth Acevedo, um, and just let students from all over the city come and hear these amazing authors speak about their books, get their books signed, and they also get to um, experience and visit a different type of library. So we love to be able to, again, support our educators and our educators say that is one of their favorite school trips. And also I wanna point out that because of the pandemic, we had to look at our summer reading program differently. So we had a virtual summer camp, but of course, uh, because family, students, that digital divide is really real. We also did book giveaways along with activities that were given out to schools. So again, you go pick up your meal and you could get a library kit. And we had about four different levels of that. Okay, now we could go to the different slide. I just wanted to highlight uh, the important partnership between public and school libraries. This right here is a screenshot of the first page of our menu of services that we share with school librarians. Uh, because again, we like to be a good partner with them. And we uh, usually show what we can offer to students, parents, teachers, um, and we align it to the AASL standards because we know that it's important for you to be able to talk to your administration about us coming to to work with you guys because we know that classroom time is very important as well. Okay, next slide. Um, when we partner with schools, a lot the top top collaboration is library card drives. So that's an example. Uh, when schools were open, we actually gave out physical cards, but now we're doing the, the e cards. Next slide. Along with that, we also come in and show um, the different classes how to access, you know, ebooks and our databases using their public library card. So it's not about just giving out a card and saying good luck. It's about letting them know how to use it. Um, next slide. So in this uh, post-COVID world, we, we still wanted to make sure we, we, we uh, kept contact with our schools. So we did um, do virtual office hours. Um, we, used a, we used a platform called LibAnswers, but again, um, school librarians are able to connect with us. They could email the school visits at nypl.org and then we will set up a time to meet with them. And they've even connected us with some of their parents who may have had um, difficulties signing up for their e-card. So next slide. Um, along with collaborations, I would like to highlight some of the resources and programming that's coming from BCALA. So this wonderful webinar, again, I want to give kudos to uh, both Karen Lemons and Casey Boyd for spearheading this. It's absolutely amazing. I also want to highlight this book list, which was in um, partnership with the Association for Library Service to Children. To, um, and this book list is 
community, connecting, cultivating, and constructing conversations through literacy. And those two lovely ladies were on the committee to create this uh, book list. Please check it out. Next slide. Um, the next program that I do want to highlight is the Plant a Book, Grow a Reader program, which will be happening um, Sunday, August 16th at 3 p.m. Um, this is again a free, free webinar and we will have a list of speakers. Um, we will have an author to kick it off and we will at the end have, because it's a, a virtual baby shower, because um, I'm due any day now, but all proceeds will go to early, early literacy centers across the country in predominantly African-American neighborhoods. So again, where you see um, the donate, it's not you donating money, it's going to be a form for you to fill out the early literacy center you will want your books donated to. Uh, Penguin Random House is sponsoring this program. So all the books will come from Penguin Random House and will be mailed directly to your early literacy center. So again, just come, learn, have fun, and put in your early literacy center so that they can receive free, diverse books. Um, next slide. And like Rudy already highlighted, um, he highlighted our mission of, for the Black Caucus. And again, it's just about promoting nationwide awareness and use of children's and young adult literature through programming, publications, outreach activities, and professional development. So we are so, so proud and thankful for our school librarian committee. They've been doing amazing work and I know they will continue to do it. This, this is just the beginning. Next slide. So we welcome all of you all the school librarians that are participating in this webinar to be part of that amazing committee. If you're not a school librarian and you're a public librarian, we also have a committee for you. We have a committee for all librarians. So definitely again, go to bcala.org and go to where it says committees and see where you want to be. Last slide, I would like to just really, really quickly say thank you for everything. And I just appreciate just watching this and learning. It's been really, really a great evening. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Well, again, we are looking for um, great feedback and we're looking at it in the chat. We also, I also want to be able to direct, we have our virtual swag bag, which has wonderful things and information resources. Uh, we have different vendors that have provided free services for a trial period. So that's also a wonderful thing. So just to recap, we had wonderful presenters. We were able to talk about the uh, trends, uh, the information of marketing and branding. We were able to talk about our resources and we were actually able to talk about the transition of where our library is today. But we have another question and, and I know that we wanna be able to show you that we are for everyone. And remember, it's great and I am not knocking anybody, but it is so great to see so many African American librarians online because I myself, when I go places, I might be the only one. So. Sometimes it is great to know that we are actually out there and it's great to see that we have even colleagues that may not be of our same ethnicity, but they also wanna be able to help, be able to serve because at the end of the day, we have patrons of everyone because we are in a, in a nation where we're all different colors and ethnicities. So we do have one question that I do wanna just be able to um, uh, talk about because I don't want her to think that there's anything different, but 
She says, could our librarians of color talk just a little bit how they would like their Caucasian colleagues to ask questions of them and to get their take on how to proceed on specific programs or ideas, or would they prefer us not to even ask the questions? Being the only one can be tough and exhausting. And so we understand that you cannot speak for the entire black population. So if I can have anyone to be able to do that, I think I've probably already summed it up that we are not biased in anything. And we have patrons of all nationalities as well as ethnicities. So whatever it is that they are seeking, we are providing that information. And, and as a librarian, a library media specialist, whether you're an academic, whether you're in elementary school, high school, or even college, or even the public library, you have to give credible and the right answers, and it cannot be biased. And I think that that might sum that up, but is there anybody else that would like to be able to um, uh, add to that? Because I think that that's, um, I think that that's what the librarian is looking for. And if not, she can also, you can contact me. I'm dbaker at d168.org. And again, we're all librarians. We're here to serve our public, no matter what nationality or creed you are. If there's any issues, if there's any programs, we will give you factual information, and that's what our job is supposed to be. So I want to just say thank you very much. If there's any other questions, and we have our virtual swag bag. I also have provided uh, a link in our uh, chat box for you to be able to fill out our survey and we also would love for you to be able to join our bcala thank you thank you danielle amazing amazing <laughs> did that amazing thank